Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Old South Meeting House. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to a program called A Conversation with Henry David Thoreau. This is the first program in a two-part series, Conversations with Hawthorne and Thoreau. My name is Erica Lindemood. I'm the Education Director here at Old South Meeting House. Today is October 24th, 1855. Henry Thoreau is 38 years old and has lived in Concord, Massachusetts his entire life. He is the author of two books. His first, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, was published in 1849. His latest work, Walden, or Life in the Woods, was published last year by T Tickner and Fields of Boston. Mr. Thoreau has written numerous essays, and his works have appeared in such prestigious journals as Graham's Monthly Magazine, Sarton's Union Magazine, the United States Magazine and Democratic Review, and the Boston Miscellany of Art and Literature. As Mr. Thoreau rarely leaves his customary seclusion in order to address the public, what he has to say will likely be of great interest. We trust the complete attention to the speaker by his auditors will give no offense to the speaker. Gentlemen and ladies, Mr. Henry D. Thoreau of Concord, Massachusetts. Thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. She is exactly right in saying that I rarely leave my customary seclusion. Uh, I prefer to stay in Concord, but you have asked for me and you have paid for me and so you shall have me, even though I bore you beyond all precedent. Walking or the wild. I wish to speak a word for nature, for absolute freedom in wildness, as contrasted with a freedom and culture merely civil, to regard man as an inhabitant or a part and parcel of nature rather than as a member of society. I wish to make an extreme statement. If so, I may make an emphatic one, for there are enough champions of civilization. The minister and the school committee and every one of you will take care of that. I have met with but one or two persons in the course of my life who understood the art of walking, that is, of taking walks, who had a genius, so to speak, for sauntering, which word is beautifully derived, quote, from idle people who roved about the country in the Middle Ages and asked charity under pretense of going a la saint Terre to the Holy Land till the children exclaimed, there goes a saint terror, a saunterer, a holy lander. They who never go to the holy land in their walks as they pretend are indeed mere idlers and vagabonds. But they who do go there are saunterers in the good sense such as I mean. Some, however, would derive the word from sans terre, without land or home which therefore, in the good sense, will mean having no particular home, but is equally at home everywhere. For this is the secret of successful sauntering. He who sits still in a house all the time may be the greatest vagrant of all. But he, but he, but the saunterer in the good sense is no more vagrant than the meandering river, which is all the while sedulously seeking the shortest course to the sea. But I prefer the first, which indeed is the most probable derivation. For every walk is a sort of crusade preached by some Peter the hermit in us to reconquer the Holy Land from the hands of the infidels. It is true we are but faint-hearted crusaders, even the walkers nowadays, who undertake no persevering, never-ending enterprises. Our expeditions are but tours, and we come around again at evening to the same old hearthside from which we set out. Half the walk is but retracing our steps. We should go forth on the shortest walk perchance in the spirit of undying adventure, never to return, prepared to send back our embalmed hearts only to our desolate kingdoms. If you are ready to leave father and mother and brother and sister and wife and child and friends and never see them again, if you have paid your debts and made your will and settled all your affairs and are a free man, then you are ready for a walk. I think that I cannot preserve my health and spirits unless I spend four hours a day at least, and it is commonly more than that, sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields, absolutely free from all worldly engagements. 
you may safely say a penny for your thoughts or a thousand pounds. When sometimes I am reminded that the mechanics and shopkeepers stay in their shops not only all the forenoon, but all the afternoon too, sitting with crossed legs, so many of them, as if legs were made to sit upon and not to walk or stand upon, I think that they deserve some credit for not having all committed suicide long ago. When we walk, we naturally go to the fields and woods. What would become of us if we walked only in a garden or a mall? Of course, it is of no use to direct our steps to the woods if they do not carry us thither. I am alarmed when it happens that I have walked a mile in the woods bodily without getting there in spirit. In my afternoon walk, I would fain forget all my morning occupations and my obligations to society. But it sometimes happens that I cannot easily shake off the village. The thought of some work will run in my head, and I am not where my body is. I am out of my senses. In my walks, I would fain return to my senses. What business have I in the woods if I am thinking of something out of the woods? I suspect myself and cannot help a shudder when I find myself so implicated even in what are called good works, for this may sometimes happen. My vicinity in Concord affords many good walks, and though for so many years I have walked almost every day and sometimes for several days altogether, I have not yet exhausted them. An absolutely new prospect is a great happiness, and I can still get this any afternoon. Two or three hours walking will carry me to as strange a country as I expect ever to see. I can easily walk 10, 15, 20, any number of miles commencing by my own door without going by any house, without crossing a road except where the fox and the mink do. First along the river, and then the brook, and then the meadow, and the woodside, there are square miles in my vicinity which have no inhabitant. From many a hill I can see civilization in the abodes of man afar. The farmers and their works are scarcely more obvious than woodchucks and their burrows. Man and his affairs, church and state and school, trade and commerce, and manufacturers and agriculture, even politics, the most alarming of them all, I am pleased to see how little space they occupy in the landscape. What I have been preparing to say is that in wildness is the preservation of the world. Every tree sends its fibers forth in search of the wild. The city is imported at any price. Men plow and sail for it. From the forest and wilderness come the tonics and barks which brace mankind. I believe in the forest and in the meadow and in the night in which the corn grows. We require an infusion of hemlock spruce or arbor vitae in our tea. There is a difference between eating and drinking for strength and from mere gluttony. The Hottentots eagerly devour the marrow of the kudu and other antelopes raw as a matter of course. Some of our northern Indians eat raw the marrow of the Arctic reindeer as well as various other parts, including the summits of the antlers as long as they are soft. And herein, perchance, they have stolen a march on the cooks of Paris. They get what usually goes to feed the fire. This is probably better than stall-fed beef and slaughterhouse pork to make a man of. Give me a wildness whose glance no civilization can endure, as if we lived on the marrow of kudus devoured raw. At present, in Concord, the best part of the land is not private property. The landscape is not owned, and the walker enjoys comparative freedom. But possibly the day will come when it will be partitioned off into so-called pleasure grounds in which a few will take a narrow and exclusive pleasure only, when fences shall be multiplied and man traps and other engines invented to confine men to the public road, and walking over the surface of God's earth shall be construed to mean trespassing on some gentleman's grounds. To enjoy a thing exclusively is commonly to exclude yourself from the true enjoyment of it. Let us improve our opportunities then before the evil days come. Hope and the future for me are not in lawns and cultivated fields, not in towns and cities, but in the impervious and quaking swamps. When formerly I have analyzed my partiality for some farm which I had contemplated purchasing, I have frequently found that I was attracted solely by a few square rods of impermeable and unfathomable bog, a natural sink in one corner of it. That was the jewel which dazzled me. 
I derive more of my subsistence from the swamps which surround my native town than from the cultivated gardens in the village. When I would recreate myself, I seek the darkest wood, the thickest and most interminable, and to the citizen, most dismal swamp. I enter a swamp as a sacred place, a sanctum sanctorum. There is the strength, the marrow of nature. Yes, though you may think me perverse, if it were proposed to me to dwell in the neighborhood of the most beautiful garden that ever human art contrived, or else of a dismal swamp, I should certainly decide for the swamp. In short, all good things are wild and free. There is something in the strain of music, whether produced by an instrument or by the human voice, which by its wildness, to speak without satire, reminds me of the cries emitted by wild beasts in their native forest. It is so much of their wildness as I can understand. Give me for my friends and neighbors wild men, not tame ones. The wildness of the savage is but a faint symbol of the awful ferity with which good men and lovers meet. We had a remarkable sunset one day last November. I was walking in a meadow, the source of a small brook, when the sun at last, just before setting, after a cold gray day, reached a clear stratum in the horizon, and the softest, brightest morning sunlight fell on the dry grass and on the stems of the trees in the opposite horizon and on the leaves of the shrub oaks on the hillside, while our shadows stretched long over the meadow eastward as if we were the only motes in its beams. It was such a light as we could not have imagined a moment before, and the air also was so warm and serene that nothing was wanting to make a paradise of that meadow. When we reflected that this was not a solitary phenomenon, never to happen again, but that it would happen forever and ever, an infinite number of evenings, and cheer and reassure the latest child that walked there, it was more glorious still. The sun sets on some retired meadow where no house is visible, with all the glory and splendor that it lavishes on cities, and perchance as it has never set before, where there is but a solitary marsh hawk to have his wings gilded by it, or only a musquash looks out from his cabin, and there is some little black vein brook in the midst of the marsh, just beginning to meander, winding slowly round a decaying stump. We walked in so pure and bright a light, gilding the withered grass and leaves, so softly and serenely bright, I thought I had never bathed in such a golden flood without a ripple or a murmur to it. The west side of every wood and rising ground gleamed like the boundary of Elysium, and the sun on our backs seemed like a gentle herdsman driving us home at evening. So we sauntered toward the Holy Land, till one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done, shall perchance shine into our minds and hearts, and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light, as warm and serene and golden as on a bankside in autumn." Thank you very much. Thank you. I trust it's too transcendental for some of you here in Boston. Now, I rarely come into the city. Uh, I usually leave cities more willingly than I go into them. And uh, I did uh, spend four years of my life in Cambridge when I was wasting my time at Harvard College. Uh, and I do come into Boston on occasion my publisher, uh, Mr. Tickner and Mr. Fields, are right across the street, and they were the ones that published my book last year, Walden or Life in the Woods. Uh, how many of you have read my book, Walden? Any of you? Oh, some of you, very good. And have any of you read my first book, A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers? One man, thank you, sir. Thank you. And, and uh, the woman, thank you very much. Uh, you are two of the few that have read it. Uh, we published 1,000 copies in 1849, and my so-called publisher, uh, not Mr. Tickner and Mr. Fields, but Mr. Monroe, my so-called publisher returned 706 unsold copies to my house last year. I tell Mr. Emerson that I now have a personal library of almost 900 volumes, over 700 of which I wrote myself. Now, I, I do not lecture often. I, I do not uh, appear in front of audiences. I would be prepared to take questions at this juncture if you have any about myself or about Concord or what have you. So uh, feel free to ask whatever you wish. I do not like, she asked me why a swamp is better than a garden. 
I do not like tame nature. I, I prefer to see nature at her, her wildest, at her best. And I find that a swamp is, uh, is about the best place where that may be discovered. Um, I am not Mr. Alcott. He prefers to have his gardens in nice orderly rows uh, with uh, everything in its place. I prefer to see nature when there is no order. When it comes to nature, I prefer to see chaos. And uh, that is why I like swamps. Well, I find that most cities should have uh, as much wildness as possible. And if he is going to do something like that, I would certainly approve of it. Uh, the trouble that we have in Concord, as I said in my lecture, is uh, we have very few wildness left in our village. Almost all of the trees have been gone since well before the revolution. I was just talking to a uh, surveyor not too long ago, and he told me that he thinks only about 10% of Concord has trees. The rest is open farmland. And you cannot go anywhere in Concord day or night without hearing the sound of an ax. Um, I think that every city and town uh, and, and county should take a, a section of land that uh, is wildness and, and set it aside for recreation and for education uh, so that uh, the trees would not be cut down for firewood or for shipbuilding or what have you. Uh, that way we may be able to see some of the trees before they are all gone. Mr. Thoreau, in the swamp, I wonder if you've ever taken a step and sunk in and had to pull yourself out. I was uh, trapped in a swamp once up in Maine. Uh, the first time that I had gone to Maine with my cousin, who was a land speculator, we were led across a uh, dismal swamp by an Indian, and uh, he told us to wait for him. But then my cousin decided to try to find his way through the swamp, and uh, we were trapped there for several hours, and we did have our feet stuck on occasion trying to get through. Uh, once the Indian found us, he was quite surprised that we got lost in the swamp in the first place. And he said it was very easy, just follow the trees because they all look different. And uh, that is where I learned that, uh, that the Indians are, are much more at home in the woods than we are. Um, when you see a white man in the woods, you, you, he seems out of place. When you see a man in the, in the woods or even in a swamp, uh, um, uh, he seems very much at home. And, and I would like to be at home in the woods like the Indians are, or the swamps. I've been counting tree rings in the swamps of Concord lately. Uh, since all of the trees are being cut down, I can then uh, count the tree rings, so that is one good thing. What animal do I like to study? Well, perhaps the one animal I, I like to study the most in, in our house is my cat, Min. Uh, do you have a cat? Oh, if any of you have a cat, are there ever times where the cat runs around and around as if it is uh, somehow half insane for no reason. Uh, last winter, we had just gotten Min, and I uh, live in the attic of my mother and father's house, and I had the window open about a crack uh, for the air to come in because it was so hot, and Min came running up the stairs and ran around and around and ran out my window. I am on the third floor. And we had had a terrific snow last winter, and there was a snow drift on the side of the house I looked out the window and there was a hole where I saw the cat go through and I thought, well, that is the end of that cat. Well, about two days later, I was going out for my usual afternoon walk. I opened the front door in the middle of a blizzard and there was the cat sitting on the front step. And she immediately came into our house and, and crawled under the stove and, and stewed her brains for a few hours and uh, seemed none the worse for wear. And so I enjoy studying our cat more than anything else. Uh, in the woods of Concord, I see a fox on occasion. That is about the largest animal that I will see, minks and muskrats. Uh, when I was living at Walden Pond, I, I studied the woodchucks because they were eating my beans. Um, there was one particularly large fat woodchuck who was eating my beans, and so I caught him and ate him. I don't study him anymore. Have I seen wolves? I have, I have heard wolves and coyotes in Maine uh, and, and in the north, but not in Concord. They are called passive wolves. Is that the name you said, passive wolf? Packs. Oh, packs of wolves. No, I've not seen any wolves in Concord, but in Maine I heard them. Um, you mentioned that when you're out in the wild, you try to avoid thinking about the village or the city. So 
do you prefer to like keep your mind empty or do you try to actively think about the nature that's around you? I try to keep my mind empty. When I go into the woods, the first thing I do is I forget everything I've learned about the woods from books and whatnot. I think that uh, you can learn great things from books, but when you are in the woods, you should have the woods teach you uh, about themselves. Uh, when I go for my walks, I'm usually by myself. Sometimes I have a companion, but my friends do not know when to be quiet. And when I'm walking in the woods, I prefer to hear the woods talk to me. Uh, and so uh, I will go for my walks by myself, and then I will visit with Mr. Emerson and Mr. Alcott later, uh, after I'm finished walking in the woods. Now, how many of you have been to Concord and been to Walden Pond? I should tell you that when you go into Concord, uh, do not believe anything you hear about me. <laughs> you know how small villages are with gossip. Uh, they would tell you that I was some sort of a hermit living in the woods, but uh, when I was living at Walden some years ago, I had more society uh, in the woods than I ever had in my life. I do not mind society, but I prefer solitude. I love to be alone. I find that there really is no companion as companionable as solitude, and I try to be by myself. I, I try to cultivate obscurity a, as much as I can. Um, I mean, I love my friends and family a great deal, but if I'm with them a lot, I begin to hate them after a while. Um, I love them better when they are at a distance. I lived at Walden Pond for just over two years. I, I left for as good a reason as I went there. Uh, I left because I felt that I had given enough time to that one life and it was perhaps uh, time to move on, that I had several more lives to live. Uh, I was there to write my first book. I finished that. I finished several essays and a lecture. Uh, and Mr. Emerson asked me to move into his house and watch over his family while he was abroad. He went to England for a year to lecture. I, I could have lived at Walden Pond my entire life, but that would have been too easy. And, and, and living is not about taking the easy way out. That is just being lazy. And so... Uh, I gave enough time to that one life, and I've been living several lives since then. I did. I lived at Walden Pond for two years, two months, and two days. Have you read my book? A little bit. How old are you? You were smarter than the eight-year-olds in Concord, that is for sure. I'm curious what your inspiration has been or a person that inspired you to write in general. I had not done any writing uh, of any uh, great shakes at all, but when I had first graduated from Harvard College in 1837, I moved back home and was introduced to Ralph Waldo Emerson, my friend. Uh, he had recently moved to my, my village. I was born in Concord, and I've lived there my entire life. Um, Mr. Emerson suggested that I keep a journal, and he also suggested that I perhaps try my hand at writing, which I have been doing ever since. So in, in the sense uh, of being a writer, I suppose it is Mr. Emerson's fault. Uh, but Mr. Emerson is forever finding poets and writers and philosophers uh, that come to Concord. Because of Mr. Emerson, our village has become quite the center for poets and writers and philosophers and other assorted near-do-wells. Uh, they're all in Concord because of him. But uh, he has been a, a fine inspiration, at least when I was younger, and uh, he is the famous man of Concord. As I said, I, I enjoy my obscurity. I do not know if I would want to live the way that Mr. Emerson lives with all of the pilgrims, so-called, coming to his house and wanting to sit at his feet. Uh, that is the sort of life that I would not want to live. Um, even with his friends, there are some days that Mr. Emerson is so great, I cannot get within 10 feet of him. Uh, but uh, I think that he enjoys his fame, uh, and that is fine, but it is, it is not for me. And, uh, but he has been a good friend for these almost 20 years now. Well, at Harvard, they teach you how to earn a living, but they do not teach you how to truly live. They tell you how to get a job, and uh, they do not tell you uh, how to go out and make something of your life uh, so that you are not only good, uh, but good for something and, and happy as well. I learned more the, the two years that I lived at Walden Pond uh, than the four years I was in Cambridge. I learned languages, which is good. Uh, and certainly Mr. Emerson, again, as a Harvard graduate, he is proud of Harvard, and he says that Harvard teaches all of the branches of education, to which I reply, yes, all of the branches, but none of the roots, uh, meaning that I do not find it very practical. Uh, in fact, when I graduated from Harvard, I discovered that I had studied... Uh, uh, how to uh, row a boat and, and how to get across the ocean. And I do not remember that at all. Uh, but it was there on, on the papers that I received. So uh, 
I think that I am much happier learning from life rather than learning from books and learning from Harvard College. A particular season that I prefer, I enjoy October. Uh, October is the month of painted leaves and uh, I enjoy walking through the leaves this time of year. Now that they are all turning brown and falling on the ground, it reminds me very much of, of walking uh, through piles of, of leather or pirate piles of scrap tin, the way that they are all piled up. Uh, I enjoy October, I enjoy autumn, but come winter, I will probably tell you that my favorite season is winter. Uh, come spring, I will probably sing the, the glories of spring, and in the summer, I will tell you how much I enjoy summer. And so I, I prefer all of the seasons when they are here. That was one of the chief advantages of living at Walden Pond, was being able to watch the seasons change. And uh, I, I enjoy all of the seasons. Uh, I enjoy nature in all of her moods. But I am currently enjoying October. We have had a spectacular fall in Concord in terms of, of the painted leaves. And I've enjoyed that immensely this year. Although we had some merry snowstorms last winter, I enjoyed that too. Why did you choose to live in Concord? I was born there. I had no choice. <laughs> I've lived there my entire life. I, I spent uh, a few months in New York City many years ago. Have you been to New York City? Uh, you do not go. <laughs> then, uh, close your eyes. I'm going to count down from three, two, one. Open your eyes. Welcome back to 2014. My name is Richard Smith. I'm a historian. This is my job. Uh, I've been doing this now for 16 years. And my main area uh, where I work is actually at Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, this was 1855. Mr. Thoreau had about seven more years to live. Uh, he died in May of 1862 at the age of 44 from tuberculosis. And uh, the only two books that he had published in his life were the two books that we talked about. But as he was dying, uh, he worked on several essays, uh, one of which was Walking, uh, which was published uh, shortly after he died by Mr. Tickner and Mr. Fields uh, just across the way. So, but ladies and gentlemen, it was a pleasure. I, I do rarely come into Boston. So thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you.